And so now the last, I guess, just to wrap up, the last question in there is that all this is fine. We've understood, you know, what uh, we've understood what a social planner would do. So we've understood what is the desirable level of unemployment of tightness. You know, what is the efficient level of unemployment and tightness? The natural question is, you know, how come we are not there naturally? You know, why do we need the governments to do anything to get? to that level of tightness, to get to that level of unemployment. And it's a good question because if you believe in perfect competition, you know, uh, perfect markets, uh, you're always at that point. You know, like one of the key theorems when you have perfect competition is that just by letting the market run its course, you will achieve efficiency. So one of the key theorems of um, kind of neoclassical economics, the first welfare theorem, second welfare theorems, these theorems are claiming that, I mean, they are showing that if you have perfect competition on the market, so no intervention from the government whatsoever, you should always reach efficiency. Okay, and, and that's kind of the theoretical basis for kind of a free markets kind of uh, ideology. Uh, in a sense, like it's a little bit underlying also kind of the capitalist ideology, this idea that if we have perfect competition, if we get rid of the government um, to achieve this perfect competition, then we know that the world would operate efficiently. Um, so, you know, so why doesn't that work here? Well, here it doesn't work because we do not have perfect competition. Here instead we model the world as a ma a markets, not as being perfect, perfectly competitive, but as having a matching structure. Once you allow for a matching structure, there is absolutely no guarantee that your world is efficient. So the whole kind of um, free market ideology or capitalist ideology totally collapses here because there is no guarantee that without government intervention you will have, uh, you will be able to sustain uh, efficiency. And of course, uh, you know, these, these markets, at least for the labor market, the matching Market is a much more accurate description of reality you know, because in the real world we do see people being unemployed, we do see firms posting vacancies, we do see firms allocating workers to recruiting. So the description we provide is a much richer and much more accurate description than the you know perfectly competitive market in which everybody has a job and you can hire whoever you want immediately at no cost. You know. uh, this is a much more accurate description of reality, but it turns out that under that description. Uh, yeah, there is no guarantee that the market will operate efficiently and therefore there will be a role for the government to try to stabilize our labor market and try to bring unemployment at the right level. And that's also in line, in, in line with what the law says. You know, if, if we saw that market would always operate efficiently, there would be no need to pass a law that says that the government and the central bank have to cooperate to bring, to maintain the economy as full employment or to maintain the economy at its efficient level. If markets were operating efficiently, you know, this would be done without the government's intervention. So that would be totally redundant. The fact that lawmakers felt that it was important to codify that means that yeah, it's very likely that markets do not always operate efficiently. Uh, and from a theoretical perspective, so what is it, what's so special about the matching market or what's so special about the perfectly competitive market that allows it to be always efficient, whereas here it's not always efficient. Well, the key difference is that in perfect, when you have perfect competition, the, the wage is subject to supply, is always, you postulate that the wage will always be subject to supply equal demand, and that allows, you, uh, that allows you to ensure that you have efficiency. In a matching market, as we said, you need to make an assumption about where the wage comes from. You have to assume a wage function and then under that wage function a lot of things will you know next February will arise and, and things will happen. But the thing is that so there is you could postulate a wage function that ensures efficiency and there is one unique wage function that does that. But there is no reason that this is a wage function that actually is realistic. And under all other wage functions efficiency is not going to be guaranteed. So the issue is that the the wage function that prevail in the real world, there is no guarantee that that wage function leads to efficiency. So basically, there is no guarantee that the wage function 
incentivize firm to post just the right amount of vacancies so that we can reach that tightness data star and that unemployment rate you star. And if the wage function is not ju at that just right level that incentivizes labor demand, you know, to be just right to get uh, an equilibrium tightness of data star, then, you know, firm may post too many vacancies if the wage is too low, too few vacancies if the wage is too high, and we are not going to be at data star. Okay, so um, the problem in the real world uh, in the real world the issue is that uh, the wedge function may not uh, guarantee that um, theta is equal to theta star. So basically firms may not have the incentive to post, you know, a number of vacancies such that Uh, theta equal theta star and u is equal to u star and so on. <coughs> and as a result, um, government intervention you know, may be needed. to bring labor market closer, at least, closer to efficiency. And that point where efficiency is reached is the point we've just described where, where the number of producers is maximized on the curve we've seen here, with the condition that we've introduced here that it's a point that's described by u of theta over tau of theta is equal to eta over one minus theta. So this is our efficiency uh, this is our efficiency condition. Uh, and so we can check in the real world if, if it holds or not to know whether or not we are at efficiency. We can compare u, we can compare tau, uh, and try to see, uh, try to see whether it's equal to eta over one minus eta to see whether we have efficiency. Um, okay. So this was, uh, so this kind of the setup in a very basic matching model. There are a bunch of things that are missing. Well, I mean, so first of all, it's very specific to the matching model with its specific structure. Uh, we've also completely, as I said, omitted the fact that the value of time may be different for employed and unemployed worker. You know, it's possible that you know employed worker could be uh, much, uh, much like say much um, worse off than an employed work than employed worker, and so you could have a cost of unemployment that's um, quite high if uh, an employed worker do suffer, you know, uh, like say mental health cost or, uh, you know, physical health cost from, uh, from not working. Uh, so, you know, it would be good to allow for that. Or, you know, maybe an employed worker actually are just very happy, having lots of leisure and in fact may not be suffering at all, but then they would enjoy their time much more than employed worker. And, you know, that would also affect the um, social welfare calculation we've done, so it would be good to be able to um, to allow for that as well. Um, so now what we can do is completely generalize the framework that we've been looking at um, in, in various ways to have a much more general description of efficient unemployment, and we'll see that this generalization will also lead to a characterization that will be um, very easy to check in the data. So we'll you know, by generalizing, actually, we'd we'll be able to, interestingly, you know, simplify the characterization of the efficient unemployment rate in a way that would become, um, you know, very convenient for governments to uh, set checks. So then, you know, we'll we'll, ex we'll express that efficiency condition in terms of statistics 
It would be very easy to measure in the real world. So actually, government, you know, we have a formula that governments can check very quickly to know how far they are from, uh, from efficiency. But to do that, we have to actually, in fact, generalize the setup, um, which is what we are going to do uh, next.